Welcome. My name is Marisa Rodriguez and I'm the NAJGA manager. NAJGA or the North American Japanese Garden Association is an organization that's dedicated to connecting and supporting the Japanese garden community. Thanks to support provided by the Japan Foundation, this series inspired by Dr. Kendall Brown's book, Quiet Beauty, will focus on the history and development of Japanese gardens in the US. Today, we continue with part eight of our 14 week webinar series. In this webinar, we'll look at gardens that were designed around the turn of the century. These are gardens that continue to adapt the Japanese garden form in North America, taking fundamental precepts of Japanese garden design, but integrating them in ways that were unique to their needs and location. Now, I'd like to introduce Larry Rosenzweig, who will present about the Murakami Museum and Japanese gardens. Larry Rosenzweig is president of LFR Consulting, whose mission is building capacity for museums, gardens, and other nonprofits. He was the founding director of the Murakami Museum and Japanese Gardens in Delray Beach, Florida. Growing the organization over 28 years from a startup organization to one that had a $4 million annual budget, accredited by the American Alliance of Museums and with a $5 million endowment. As the Norton Museum of Arts Director of Advancement, he raised four to $6 million a year for operations and personally solicited and closed gifts from 100,000 to $3.5 million. Larry earned his BA and MA in East Asian Studies from Harvard and University of Michigan, respectively, and lived in Japan for two years. He periodically organizes and leads study tours of Japan and collects and sells Japanese art. In 2005, Larry was decorated by the Emperor of Japan with the Order of the Rising Sun for his work with Murakami and as founder of the Japan America Society of South Florida and the Delray Beach Miyazu Sister Cities Organization. Larry is also currently NAJGA's president for which we are very appreciative. Welcome, Larry. Thank you, Marissa. And my deepest thanks to Hoichi Kurisu for helping me remember and understand much of the thinking that went into the making of Rojian. Also to Michiko Krisu and Krisu LS LLC for most of the garden photographs. And similar thanks to Bonnie LeMay and Morikami Museum and Japanese Gardens for historical and other photos. Now, within the broader topic of millennial Japanese gardens, let me give you an, an overview of what I'm going to be talking about and what I'm not going to be talking about. I'm not going to discuss much about the overall history of Japanese gardens, uh, or in fact, the design, construction, or planting, or even most of the uses and activities that take place at Rojien. But I am going to talk about how this particular garden came to be created, some of the specific issues faced in the practical realm of getting from concept to reality, what makes, Mori, what makes Rojian at Morikami special, and how that relates to the topic of millennial gardens. Morikami Museum's Rojian Garden was the first Japanese garden to open in the new millennium, the 21st century and designer Hoichi Kurisu wanted to make a statement about this epochal transition and symbolize it in this late rock garden with his broken wall that denotes a partial break with past tradition and draws the viewer's eye off into the limitless, unforeseeable future of humanity. A native of Hiroshima, Japan, Hoichi Kurisu is widely known and respected as one of the foremost present day Japanese garden designers and as the progenitor of the healing gardens movement that has come to the forefront of the Japanese garden world. At the most recent NAJGA conference in Portland in 2018, he was honored for his work that includes the Portland Garden, Anderson Garden, Frederick Mayer Garden, Morikami, and many other public and private gardens, both in North America and in Japan. 
So why is there a museum of Japanese culture in Japanese gardens in Delray Beach, Florida? In the first years of the 20th century, as Henry Flagler was building the Florida East Coast Railway that opened South Florida to development, a young Japanese man named Joe Sakai was looking for an opportunity. Flagler needed people to live and work near, and most importantly, to use the railroad. Sakai, for his part, could provide young men willing to move all the way from Japan to till the Florida soil and make their fortunes. Among the early recruits from Sakai's hometown of Miyazu was Morikami Skeji, who adopted the name George. Morikami left Japan at age 19 in 1906, never to return. An independent sort, Morikami left Yamato after a few years and began buying and selling real estate. But he lost everything in the 1920s bust, but re he resumed quickly buying and holding land. During World War II, despite severe restrictions on his movements and his bank accounts, Morikami acquired much of the nearly 200 acres he eventually donated to Palm Beach County in the 1970s that became Morikami Park. George continued growing pineapples on his land up until his death in early 1976. And in gratitude for George Morikami's generous donation of land, Palm Beach County Parks and Recreation Department decided to build a, quote, museum of Japanese history, unquote. George died at age 89 during the construction of the building, roughly modeled on Katsura Villa. I was hired about five months after his death, and we opened the museum in June 1977 with a small surrounding garden designed by Seishiro Tomioka. Although it was clear from the start that the Yamatokan, as we named the original museum building, was not an adequate facility for a museum, it took until 1993 to build the, quote, new museum now able to host high quality Japanese art exhibitions, to store safely uh, collections of art, present performing arts, lectures, and film. And with an award-winning cafe, it attracted the attention of Hoichi Krisu on the East Coast to accept an award at the White House and who paid a visit in the mid 1990s. We walked the mostly undeveloped grounds and Hoichi painted for me a picture of the garden he could envision. This slide shows the 1977 Yamato Khan in the center, the 1993 museum at the top with the garden circling counterclockwise around the lake. You can also see a large gated community to the north and west and a small part of the native pine forest is at lower right. With the enthusiasm of a recent convert, I began to sell the concept to the museum's board and staff, and most importantly to Dennis Eshelman, the resourceful director of Parks and Recreation. Eshelman bought into the concept and put together funding from impact fees uh, from multiple new housing developments like the one on our borders uh, within a five mile radius. And those fees ultimately covered the construction costs. Rojian became the first design build project in Palm Beach County history. It took plenty of arguing and coaxing to convince some bureaucrats that only Carisu could build what Carisu had designed. And it wasn't until they saw Hoichi standing in hip deep water, directing the placement of shore lining boulders that they finally got it. Similarly, in order to meet 
with our risk management department's approval, I had to walk the director through the nearly completed garden. Fortunately, despite a minefield of what she described as toe stubbers, rocks that encroached on walkways and presented personal injury lawsuit potential, uh, but she appreciated the beauty and the value of the garden and declared that we just have to live with any minor accidents. Now, although the county would pay for construction, we knew that maintenance costs would be substantial. The garden covers roughly 17 acres, including the lake, and plants grow quickly and all year round in our subtropical climate. We worked out a deal to sell naming rights with the donations being designated for an endowment. George D. and Harriet W. Cornell made a $1 million pledge. Subsequently, at George Cornell's death, just a couple of years later, we also received a very small portion of his estate, which upped the total to nearly $4 million. Additional naming gifts brought in, uh, additional naming gifts um, added to the endowment, re which reached over $5 million by the end of 2004, when my Morikami tenure ended. In the earliest planning phases of the project, Krisu, listening to his client's desire to incorporate an, ele an educational element in the design, suggested organizing the garden around the theme of changes over time in Japanese garden history. And this historical concept fit very neatly into the Morikami's broad Japanese culture mission and therefore was adopted. Kurisu also brought in Professor Makoto Suzuki to consult on this and other aspects of the garden. Once the garden was under construction, however, Kurisu increasingly focused on the therapeutic value of the garden. Koichi also preferred as little interpretation as possible so that visitors could simply experience the garden's beauty and calming effects with as few filters as possible. I argued that it was important to satisfy people's curiosity, especially on their first visit, and try to answer their likely questions, whether they pertain to restroom locations or garden design. Carissa understood from the very beginning, and we came to learn over time that in fact, visitors unconsciously felt the garden's calming effects as they moved from spaces with broad vistas bathed in the Florida sun to more tightly defined shaded sections, the yin and yang, or in Japanese, the yin and yo of the garden's design. Taking advantage of the natural pre-existing pine flatwoods in which the garden is set, Grisu also provided visitors with a shindin-yoku, or forest bathing, experience, years before that term and concept became well known in the West. Not long after Rojian opened in 2001, and after several large donations were received from cancer survivors who told us that walking the garden had helped them immeasurably in coping with their illness, we decided to look seriously into how we might measure the garden's therapeutic value and design programs to take advantage. We teamed up with researchers at the Florida Atlantic University School of Nursing, received an IMLS grant and did the research. And based on Hoichi Kurisu's concept, Morikami became the locus for the start of the healing gardens movement in, in, in North America. So, Rojian, the George D. and Harriet W. Cornell Japanese Gardens at Morikami Museum, builds on the history of an early 20th century colony of Japanese farmers and the success story of an immigrant. 
to the late 20th century development of land to meet the leisure and cultural needs of new generations of immigrants and tourists. Marking the turn of the millennium, the genius of Hoichi Kurisu transformed a thriving but incomplete museum into a cutting edge Japanese garden, a pace setting tourist attraction, and a major contributor to the well being of residents and visitors to South Florida. And I'd like to wrap up with Hoichi Kurisu's own words penned 20 years ago as part of his vision for Rojian. The merging of these elements led me to conclude that it would be insufficient merely to replicate several distinct Japanese period gardens here at the Morikami. Instead, I'm drawing from the essence of these famous individual gardens to create one garden for this modern age. I hope that visitors will let it speak to them of timeless ancient and contemporary truths, providing therapeutic insights today and that they will listen, cherish, and act on the inspiration the garden imparts to them individually. Strolling through the pine forest, the bamboo grove, seeing the rock formations, arrangements of plants, cascading waterfalls, and pausing to ponder upon the quiet surface of the lake and shoreline, little by little, laying aside the chaos of a troubled world and gradually nurturing the capacity within to hear a more harmonious universal rhythm. This is the tremendous power the Morikami Japanese Garden can hold and impart. I would like people to notice every step, every moment, to discover what we may have missed in modern life. Let's step into the 21st century invigorated, inspired. Well, I hope you're invigorated and inspired by this entire series. And I want to thank you for your interest and attention. Uh, also, thanks to Palm Beach County Parks and Recreation Department, the Morikami staff under the leadership of Park Administrator Bonnie White LeMay and Garden Curator Heather Grisbeck for continuing to care for Rogian at a high level. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Our next presenter today is Bob Byers, who will present about the Garden of the Pine Wind at Garvin Woodland Gardens. Bob learned to love gardening and plants, working beside his parents in family gardens as a child. After college, he worked professionally as a landscape architect in Wisconsin, Florida, Alabama, and Arkansas before a 21-year career as the Director of Operations and Associate Executive Director for Garvin Woodland Gardens in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Bob has served as the director of the Fort Worth Botanic Garden for over four years and now serves as assistant director and VP of horticulture of the newly merged nonprofit Fort Worth Botanic Garden Botanical Research Institute of Texas. He works with 105 dedicated employees, over 1,000 volunteers, and several active support groups. He's enjoying growing vegetables and flowers in his home garden in Willow Park, Texas, and learning about the large and varied flora of Texas. So thank you, Bob. Welcome. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting coincidence because we are within a week of the 20th anniversary of the dedication of the Garden of the Pine Wind at Garvin Woodland Garden. So this is kind of an auspicious timing for us. Uh, it has been a very interesting 20 years. I, got, I have truly enjoyed working with some of the tremendously talented people that were involved in this uh, through the years. <clears throat> but I wanted to start with this lady, Miss Verna Cook Garvin, who was the founder of the garden. <clears throat> and you can see off on the left here, a view from one of the points in the garden out towards the mountains that surround it. Uh, and Verna had several things that she wanted to share about this part of the country. But one of her key goals was to create a world-class cultural institution for Arkansas. 
Uh, we've had some interesting things come in in the last 20 years, like the Clinton Presidential Library and uh, the Crystal Bridges Museum. But at the time, Ms. Garvin started this uh, operation in the mid-1980s, uh, there was a need for cultural expression and the ability to share uh, knowledge, particularly with children, about things that they might see around the world that she had enjoyed uh, being a wealthy individual that had been able to travel widely. She wanted to illustrate great gardening and design and wooded sites. The, the property is completely covered with trees, or at least it was when we started. Uh, she wanted to preserve that to the degree that was possible because she felt that so many of those areas uh, were being lost and to educate about that natural beauty and the importance of preserving it. And finally, to leave a legacy for future generations about life in the 20th century and the fact that there were people that were concerned about preserving the natural beauty that we enjoyed at this point in time. Just uh, to kind of give you an idea about the garden and its location, it's about a 10 minute drive from Hot Springs National Park. Uh, so we were fortunate to have access to a large uh, potential audience, even though we were in a relatively small town. Uh, the property for the entire garden is 210 acres. It's in the middle of Lake Hamilton, which is one of the three diamond lakes, as they're called, that surround hot springs. Beautiful clear water lakes, uh, quite deep. And uh, the water is almost always crystal clear. This one is 7,200 acres. The largest one just upstream is 15,000 acres. So there's lots of water. And this is the most popular re recreational lake in the central part of south central part of the United States. Uh, the Garden of the Pine Wind is about seven acres and it is shown on the map in the bottom inside the blue dark blue area that's delineated down there. Uh, one of the interesting things about the property is there's 115 feet of grade change from the highest point to the to the lake level and there's 91 feet within the Japanese garden. So we'll be talking about some, some degree about how uh, that influenced what we did as we developed the garden. And as I mentioned, the entire property was pretty much covered with uh, second growth pine and hardwood upland forest. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what we wanted to do with this beautiful piece of property. Uh, I'll never forget uh, a gentleman that came up to consult with us from the Audubon Institute. And his comment to us was, so far, nobody screwed this place up. Be sure you're not the ones that do that. So we were trying to be very deliberative. Uh, we actually located David from a uh, private garden that he had done in Fayetteville were immediately interested in his talent and the things that we saw in that garden and his approach to celebrating what was beautiful about natural spaces. Uh, Marissa spoke a little bit about Dr. Schlossen in the beginning, but certainly for us, he was pivotal in the development of our garden. The other gentleman on the right here is uh, Merle Seaman, who was a landscape architect from Little Rock. Uh, the site had so much great change and so many challenges in terms of construction, we thought it was important that we brought in that skill set as well. So David was, David was the lead designer, but uh, Merle was making sure that we were covering all of our bases in, in terms of ADA, uh, protecting the site, and a lot of other things that we needed to address. I, I thought a lot over the years about all the things that we learned from this process, much of it we learned from David and subsequently from John Powell, who is a, has been a real force uh, in influencing the garden through the maintenance and additional work, uh, a lot of beautiful detailing that he's done. Uh, but the first thing was we had to get support. Uh, 
we were operating at the beginning of this attempt on $120,000 a year budget. Uh, so one of the things that we started doing immediately was reaching out to the community and trying to find support. Uh, and this picture is a pretty good demonstration of it. The uh, dump truck there belongs to Garland County and the uh, bulldozer belongs to the Weyerhaeuser Corporation. And they were both par partners with us in putting in our original paved road, which we needed to even start this development. So there were lots of pieces and they both became long-term partners with us because of this beginning relationship that we built with them. And it became more and more critical to do this as things advanced. The other huge partner on this was the state of Arkansas through a cultural, natural and cultural resources commission that funded a lot of the work. I wanna make sure we mention them. The second thing was I, I like to say, remember who's the boss. Uh, this bottom photo is showing something, some, I, our first major project that frankly, I would have rather put the money somewhere else, but we had to get people in and out. And so we spent over a million dollars building an entrance road in a parking lot, which was not the first thing on our priority list, but it had to happen in terms of practicalities. But in terms of the garden itself, I picked a couple of photographs here in terms of how the interaction with people influenced things that we needed to think about. And the top photo shows what became a much more popular area of the garden than we anticipated, primarily because it was a pond edge where not only could you enjoy beautiful views back into the upper upland part of the gardens, but also uh, we had koi in this pond and interaction with the koi became a huge thing. So everything that you're seeing in this photograph was added after the original design in order to try to harden these edges and make them more accessible to folks in terms of use. And off on the right hand side is the uh, Full Moon Bridge. And we originally built this without a handrail uh, in the thought that it would be more of a place to see than a place to be, which turned out to be wrong. People rushed to get up on this bridge and look out to the right from this perspective and see the views to the lake. So we had to come back in and think of a sensitive way to add a rail on there so that we were constantly interacting with people and how they were using the site. We had to decide early on how we wanted to tell uh, the story and create a journey within this garden. Uh, I've mentioned that we're located in Hot Springs. If you're not familiar with that area, it's the home of the oldest national park in the United States, which is around a natural hot spring that is is not caused by volcanism. So the water is highly drinkable and was considered very healthy for you. Uh, we were in the middle of a lake. Uh, we had beautiful opportunities to create natural uh, streams. And so water just seemed to be what the story was that we needed to tell. So we started thinking about how you work with water. And if you look in the lower right, this is the upper end of the garden. Uh, left hand is kind of the central area in terms of both the way you move through the garden and elevations. And at the bottom is the waterfall that David built to kind of celebrate reaching the end of your journey through the garden. Uh, he did such an impressive job with this that this waterfall is actually listed in one of the great waterfalls of Arkansas books. Uh, even though it's man-made and all, every other one in the book is, is a natural uh, and usually pretty impressive waterfall. So he, we, were, we loved working with David and the great work that he did with, with stone. We were also very concerned about using native materials. Everything that you see in the garden is native stone from Arkansas or just across the border in Oklahoma. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to understand the natural topography and how we could take advantage of it. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we were not getting in too big a hurry and letting the plants do the, the things that they wanted to do naturally because in a 210 day growing season in a bad year, you've got plenty of time uh, to let plants grow in naturally and 
really exhibit their natural forms. This is a little quick uh, sequence as to how we built the full moon bridge. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to include this is if you look at the way this went, you'll see that we kept trying things and changing our approach as we went until we found the successful things that would work for us. I ultimately ended up with jigs and uh, this beautiful bridge was the result. It's got, that's a 10 foot wide opening uh, and it's continued to be probably the most popular thing in the whole 210 acre garden. I think the other thing was that we decided this was our first garden. We had to do it right and make a big impression. One of David's big concerns was if the project was too big for him to do. Uh, he, had, he had always thought it at a much smaller intimate scale and the idea of building a seven acre garden with this kind of dramatic uh, landscape made him a little uncomfortable. I use the same approach on him that I use with my staff now when they're big, approaching big steps. And I said, let's do this in, in baby steps. Let's think about one piece at a time. And it ended up being very successful. And David spent a tremendous amount of time in Arkansas before the project uh, started learning the natural landscape and what it looks like. We also wanted to incorporate natural parts of the story uh, this is the Sunrise Bridge, one of our one of my favorite elements still as well. Uh, and it's a little bit hard to see. I couldn't find a good enough angle. But this uh, bridge has the paving of the wooden part of the of the decking based on old railroad bridges that you find all over our part of Arkansas. So we were always looking for little details like that that we could work into this and make the garden a little more about its location. This was very important to David. And the final thing was we kept and continue to think about ways to make it better. Uh, the garden was a closed loop and you had to basically walk back out up the 91 feet of hill to get back out when it was originally built. We decided that we needed somewhere on the lower end to have a way to get out into the into the remainder of the garden. And this was David's solution, the floating plow bridge. These are 14 ton boulders that were set on edge. It was a huge job to figure out how to get them down into this ravine uh, and place them. But it ended up being one, again, of our most dramatic features. And Throughout the garden, David planted hillsides full of azaleas and other plants that are well adapted here, which have ended up really tying these things in and making a beautiful setting. And finally, I wanted to leave you with the fact that not only was the Garden of the Pine Wind an important element in itself, but it helped us to set the tone for the rest of the garden. We brought David back numerous times to work on other parts of the property, including the Evans Children's Garden, which you see the tree house on the right, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the left, and the Evans Celebration Garden, which is close to our chapel, is very popular for memorial events and also weddings. Uh, so not only did we create a beautiful garden that was inspired by Arkansas and informed by the principles of Japanese gardens, but we also created an aesthetic that was taken throughout the property. Uh, I simply can't express how important this garden and David's part in it was uh, to helping us create what ended up being, in my opinion, a really good cultural asset for our state. And with that, I will turn it back over to Marissa and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Bob. Our final presentation today is from the Japanese Friendship Garden of Phoenix, Rohoen. The Rohoen team put together a recording, which I will share with you momentarily. In it, Mr. Nozumo Okita and Ben Shreff share the Rohoen story, but I'd like to briefly introduce them before I share the recording. Nozumo Okita is originally from Himeji, Japan, Phoenix's sister city. 
and he is president of Okita Bishoen. He's a landscape architect, a master of first-class garden constructor, and master of first-class garden engineer. He joined his father's business in 1969 and has been designing and creating gardens for 53 years. Okita calls his life Kuzetsu no Niwazukuri Jinsei, which translates to a garden creator's life requires unswerving determination. He has received many awards for his work and has lectured and published widely about Japanese gardens. Ben Schreff is the curator and head Niwashi at Rohoen. Ben began his horticulture and gardening career over 20 years ago in Iowa City, working at a garden center at which Ben became interested in bonsai. Later, Ben started a design and build business, which he ran for seven years before moving to St. Paul, Minnesota to work at Como Conservatory and the Charlotte Partridge Ordway Japanese Garden. There, Ben met John Powell, who he has been training with ever since. Ben took care of the Carleton College Japanese Garden for two years before moving to Phoenix almost three years ago now. Once a year, Ben travels to Japan to train at Kokuen in Himeji and with Nozumo Okita, the designer and builder of Rohoen. I will now share their video. members and friends of Rohoen. My name is Reiko Reves. I am the former executive director of Rohoen, a Japanese friendship garden of Phoenix. Thank you, Najiga, for inviting Rohoen to be part of your webinar series. I recently moved back to Japan to continue fostering our relationship between Rohoen and Kohoen. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Okita with you. He was the leader of the Rohoen design team, and then also he's, he created this beautiful Kokoen as well. I am so excited about sharing the Rohoen's history with you through Mr. Okita's uh, viewpoint and uh, I hope you enjoy his presentation. Thank you very much. And Okita san, yorosko ni Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nozomu Okita. Yorosko ni shimasu. Imakara, 当時の姫路市長、小谷松寿市から島井都市である有座なフェニックス市の広大な公園の一角に日本友好庭園建設の設計施工の依頼を受けます。その庭園の規模 砂漠の観測地帯であるアリゾナフェニックスの地に日本の庭園特有のしっとりとした落ち着きのある庭園が果たしてどのような形で作れるのか当時大いに戸惑った記憶があります日本の庭園は その時代、その時代の社会や世相を反映し時代とともに変革を起こして今日に至ります。その中で現代に生きる私の大風ワークは現代の庭とは何かを思考し今までの時代に庭ない新しい現代の庭を創造してきました。アリゾナで作る庭をどのような形の庭にするのか大いに悩みましたそれは単に日本の庭の形式や技法をそのまま移すのではなく本来
、日本庭園が持ち合わせ、合わせ持つ、えー、精神性が庭園に反映することが、上理にかなうのではないかと考えます。えー、日本の庭園の歴史は古く、えー、神社仏閣の宗教思想の庭から始まり、えー、平安貴族の庭、そして武家の庭、大名庭園、茶庭、とうとう近代には政治家や財界人の優雅な庭園を経て、えー、今、現代では商業施設、まだある店舗、特に住宅の庭園など、人々の身近な暮らしとともに庭があります。えーこの日本の美しい四季、変化に富んだ気候風土の中で、自然が人と寄り添い、慈しみ、えー、敬い、親しみ、楽しみ、自然から多くのものを享受し、共存しながら心豊かに暮らしてきます。人々が暮らす中で、庭は特別の存在ではなく、いつも庭という自然が身近にあり、日々自然と触れ合い、調整をしたいという、それほど自然は素晴らしく、かけがえのない尊いものだという、日本の、日本人の自然観が、えー、その庭園の根底には潜んでおります。えー、今、現在、えー、人類は物質的には大変豊かになりますまた、えー、スマートフォン一つで世界の情報が、えー、簡単に手に入る便利なあ世の中になります人々の暮らしは文明が発展すれば発展するほど自然とは無縁になっていく現代人は物質的な豊かさだけで満足していないだろうか。えー、美しい庭園を見ることは、利便性とは相反して、えー、人間らしさを取り戻すという行為が生まれます。人間本来の五感を正常に戻す作用も含まれています。体内に新鮮な空気を取り込み、えー、人間本来の感性、えー、感覚を呼び戻すことこそ、今の現代人の必要だと思われます。そのような、えー、多様な思いを持って、露宝園を、えー、設計を進めてまいりました。えー、今日はここに五宝園の一番当初の設計図を持ってきました。五、え、宝、ー、園を例をとする小説を書くのと同じ感覚を覚えております。まず見るうちは、こを進めて歩くに従い、いろんな風景が次から次へと、見えがくる。次はどんな風景が見えてくるだろう。また、振り返れば、同じ景色の表情が全くこう違う。水のそばを歩いたり、えー、離れたり、めくるめく風景に、おのずと期待感は高まります。そして、小山口の大滝に、演出効果を最大に原理化した心理的効果も狙っております私はどんな医師にも命が宿っていると思っております庭を作るとき特に選び抜いた医師にもう一度新たな命を吹き込むといった方が適当かもしれません私が庭を作るとき
特に重視することはその時その時の風土を一番大事に考えていることです例えば庭に使う石はその土地の産出でありたいと思っておりますだから露芳園もアリゾナにある石を使用することが最も重要なんですアリゾナの風土と日本の精神性が交わり時間の経過とともに調和していきます原始の時代から自然の巨石には神が宿りまた神が降臨をするといった原始的信仰心は自然のものすべてに対し畏敬の念を唱え続けそこに精神性が宿るのは必然でありました石には永遠の普遍性不動性を備えておりますここが唯一無二のさまざまな形色質感を持っております庭に一度据えてしまえばその姿のまま永遠に存在し続けるのですまた石は工場生産なんかできませんかけがえのない自然物でありますそれらを扱う策定者はよほど心して取り組むのは当然のことであります、えー、完成まで、えー、長い年月がかかりましたが、えー、完成を込めた、えー、露芳園がここに誕生いたしました、はい、大北さん、はい、今日はお忙しい中をありがとうございました<笑>いいえどうもありがとうございましたいいお話が聞けましたはいこちらこそありがとうございましたこれからも露芳園をよろしくお願いしますはい、はい Of course. はい、<笑>では皆さんありがとうございました。はい、ベンさん、じゃあ次お願いします。どうもバイ。バイ Hey everybody, my name is Ben Schreff and I am the garden curator and head Niwashi here at Roho Inn, the Japanese friendship garden here in, in Phoenix, Arizona.、Uh, I want to say thank you to Okita Sensei and to Reiko san、uh, for the, the previous clip. And、uh, I just want to express how, how incredibly fortunate we feel to have Mr. Okita, as well as the a m e j i Gardeners and Contractors Association, as designers and builders、uh, for our garden here, here in Phoenix, and, and also for the, the continued relationship that we have with them and, and our sister city of a m e j i including、uh, Gardeners Exchange, where、uh, Myself and, and some of our other gardeners will travel to h i m e j i for training, and then they will come here and we'll collaborate on, on projects.、Uh, it, of course, haven't had a lot of that in the past you know, year and a half,、um, but we look forward to,、uh, to restarting、uh, those programs as, as soon as we, we safely can. There's been several phases to the garden, and, and there will be, be several more as well. The, the first phase was our tea garden and, and the tea house, which was completed in, in 96.、Uh, the second phase of the garden was the main garden, which was completed in, in, two, well, completed in 2002. The garden opened in, in 2003.、Uh, our third phase included our,、uh, our restroom building, and that was in 2009. And then just in the last couple of years, we completed.、Uh, A small gift shop expansion.、Uh, our next phase will include a viewing pavilion as well as a visitor center and a, a new Kare San Sui or dry garden uh, that's uh, sort of in the middle of, of the, the master plan for the, for the visitor center. It's,、uh, it, it's really interesting to look at, look at the plans and, and the original pictures of the garden.、Um, it, it's really easy to see、uh, what a great designer Mr. Okita is. Uh, the, the stones you know, seem disproportionately huge, of course, when, when the garden was installed,、um, and, as well as the waterfall. But with the, the maturation of the garden, 
and, and of the plant material, uh, the scale now is, is really getting, getting pretty good. Of course, we have a lot of challenges with um, having mature trees and, and in, uh, in our climate, uh, we have an incredibly long growing season. So, you know, a, a 10 month or so growing season means that when stuff does get water, it grows extremely quickly. And so um, those are some of our challenges now is dealing with some of our larger plant material and trying to keep uh, everything in, in scale with the rest of the garden. As, as curator of the garden, it's, it's really important to me, uh, particularly considering our, considering our designer and, and our history here with, with Okita Sensei, that any improvements or uh, expansions that, that we make at the garden that those are in line uh, with the authenticity of the, the design and also on with the, with the quality of the design. And so, uh, for instance, uh, last last fe or two Februarys ago, we had uh, a Najga Regional Workshop here in which we uh, installed some Tobiishi and then built uh, a couple of fences in the garden. And we ended up doing a, a Kanenjigaki style fence here. And it was important to us to um, tie together the fence with our existing restroom building and mimic the, uh, the stones at the base of, of the fence, uh, just like the, the stones underneath the trim on, on the restroom building. And I always want to make sure that uh, we are enhancing uh, the design uh, and, and, of course, never uh, doing something of, of lower quality. Probably our or, or one of our bigger challenges here is uh, the fact that we have a, a Japanese garden in, in the middle of the, the Sonoran Desert. And so um, finding plant material uh, that is conducive to the, the shapes, textures, and, and, and forms um, of Japanese garden has, has certainly been uh, a challenge. However, we've also had 20 years at this point to Look at, look at what past gardeners and, and curators have used and see what has worked and, and what hasn't. And over the last few years, we, we have simplified the, the plant palette by removing some of the material that, that didn't work so well, or in some cases had just become so, so wildly overgrown that um, I felt like it was obscuring some of the, the intended views that, that Mr. Okita uh, designed uh, when he built, built the garden. Not only are our plants uh, doing better in terms of health, but I think it's also had the effect of, of pulling his composition uh, together a little better. We've, we've, with a simpler plant palette, it's easier to, um, when we look out over a vista, to get connection between different areas of the garden. As you can see, we've, we've utilized the dwarf myrtle as our tamamono and katakomi throughout the garden, uh, which has the effect of, of pulling the composition together. Through some uh, pretty aggressive uh, pruning of, of our Aleppo pines here, uh, we've, we've turned them into uh, some Niwaki throughout the garden and uh, we're happy with, with how they're, they're coming along. Uh, we're not, uh, in the desert, it's, it's pretty difficult to grow moss, of course, uh, but we have found some, some stub substitutes, uh, including uh, this Carapia, which is uh, sort of fitting the the bill for the texture that we would find with with a moss. In Mr. Okita's uh, segment, uh, they showed uh, some shots from Cocoen, which is uh, Himeji is is not only our sister city, but we also have a sister garden, uh, which is Cocoen, which is in Himeji. Mr. Okita talked about uh, the stones and, and what the stones mean to a Japanese garden and to, to him, and we feel extremely fortunate to have the stones that we do in this garden and of course Mr. Okita went out and, and hand selected all of these uh, from the mountains in, in Arizona along with the other materials that, uh, that were used to build the garden. So another big uh, development or step for us in, in the last few years is you know the garden used to be almost entirely cared for uh, by volunteers and um, not to take anything away from that. And in fact, volunteers are absolutely essential to, to the quality of the garden uh, to this day. And, and 
we couldn't appreciate our volunteers more. Um, but having the amount of time that's required to uh, maintain and upkeep uh, a Japanese garden is of course extensive. And so uh, we you know, hired myself as well as um, a couple of uh, other gardeners at this point. And so having people here, obviously for every day of the week and being able to, to start to put programs in, in place uh, to maintain and, and clean the garden on, on a daily basis um, it is what we've needed. Uh, to try to get um, the maintenance garden, maintenance of the garden up to the level of, of the initial design. And so we've been really excited about that. And our attendance has, has risen dramatically over the last few years. And, in, and as a result of that, we're of course able to, to hire more staff. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. I hope you enjoyed our our brief history and a, and a little bit of uh, our development over the last uh, 20 years or so. And thank you as always to Okita Sensei and also to Reiko San, our, our former director for uh, the piece they did in, in Japan. And uh, we hope that you'll, you'll come and visit us someday. Thank you. Thank you to the Rohoen team for putting together this amazing video. And thank you, Larry and Bob, for sharing your gardens with us today.